there is not, and there has never been, a single definitive proof of any of the major epistemological, metaphysical, meta-ethical or politico-theoretical positions, and this is because there are invariably two coherent yet contradictory perspectives through which one can approach a given problem. One from a principle-based, first-person, subjective standpoint, and the other from a fact-based, third-person, objective one. The subjective perspective is criticised for its indeterminateness and incorporeality, the objective perspective for its impermanence and contingency. The distinction is reflected in our basic psychology, and it has been recognised unanimously throughout the annals of history. For William James, it was the distinction between the tender-minded rationalist and the tough-minded empiricist. For Carl Jung, between the introvert and the extrovert. Until now, our discourse has been bound by this dialectic of opposites, for we have seen that any perspective seeking to unite pure qualitative necessity and pure quantitative observation is destined to be bound by innate contradictions. This judgement is a mistake. Our entire conception of reality is based in opposition, and only when we understand the unity in this opposition can we recognise our absolute knowledge. Self-consciousness is a subject which is its own object, and it is from the perspective of self-consciousness that the non-duality between the subjective and objective perspectives in philosophy finds meaning. In this short presentation, we shall see precisely how we have forsaken and misunderstood the conflict in our reason, and we shall see precisely how this conflict is the single true ground of the philosophical science. It was once taken for granted that every truth must be either a relation of ideas or a matter of fact, logical or empirical. In his Critique of Pure Reason of 1781, Immanuel Kant recognised that propositions regarding knowledge can be defined in terms of two dimensions, one epistemic and one semantic. The epistemic dichotomy differentiates propositions that are knowable independently of experience from reason alone, and propositions that are knowable only from experience of the external world. These propositions are named a priori and a posteriori respectively. The semantic dichotomy distinguishes propositions that are justified simply by understanding the meanings of the words involved, analytic, from propositions that are justifiable only by how those meanings relate to the world, synthetic. That is, a proposition is analytic if that which it affirms is a part of the definition of whatever it is the proposition is about. Together, these two dichotomies can be represented as shown now, giving four classes of knowledge. The distinction between the analytic a priori and the synthetic a posteriori expresses the polarity between subjectivist and objectivist forms of knowledge. Each of these classes is interesting in its own right, but in this presentation, we're interested in the analytic a posteriori. The analytic a posteriori expresses a synthesis of both the subjectivist and objectivist perspectives. Since these two perspectives are apparently mutually exclusive, we would not expect that the analytic a posteriori could represent a genuine form of knowledge. This conclusion aligns with the analysis of the analytic a posteriori given to us by Kant, for an analytic a posteriori proposition would be one that must be justified by experience, but which is also self-evident and made true by virtue of the meanings of the words it contains. As per Kant's formulation of the categories of justification, analytic judgments confer necessity, and necessity is a priori since it can be reached prior to experience. It therefore follows that there is no such thing as an analytic a posteriori truth. Again, any truth that is justified analytically does not need to be experienced to be known to be true, and so an a posteriori confirmation of an idea already known will fail to be a condition of its knowability. It will be a priori. To boot, 
Kant used the term analytic simply to refer to logical knowledge, and the term a posteriori to refer to the empirical. Despite this, Stephen Palmquist, who is one of the world's leading scholars on Kant, has argued that Kant was mistaken in this regard, and that the analytic a posteriori constitutes a genuine class of knowledge. In his book Kant's System of Perspectives, Palmquist writes, the impossibility of analytic a posteriori knowledge is generally considered to be quite evident. Indeed, it is a nonsensical contradiction in terms for those who equate analytic and a priori. Even though Kant argues against those who identify analyticity and a priority, he joins them in dismissing this class of knowledge with only a brief explanation. It would be absurd to found an analytic judgement on experience, since in forming the judgement I must not go outside my concept, there is no need to appeal to the testimony of experience in its support. There are, however, a few theorists who do regard the analytic a posteriori as providing the best description of certain types of knowledge. Notwithstanding Kant's lack of concern for this class of knowledge, I shall argue that certain aspects of his philosophy can be best understood by reinterpreting them in terms of the analytic a posteriori. The main barrier to analytic a posteriori knowledge is that it would require the innate justification of an idea or object to be fundamentally involved with any experience of it. In other words, the fact of its truth and the act of knowing it cannot be disconnected, so that there can be no possibility of it being known prior to experience. It is clear that there is one kind of entity that fits this description entirely, and which is known via precisely the analytic a posteriori. This entity is, of course, consciousness itself. We conceive the necessity of our being conscious analytically, for consciousness is required for the very possibility of its own self-conception, yet it is also true that never do we not recognise our consciousness in absence of a posteriori experience of it, it cannot be known prior to experience. On a similar line of thought, Palmquist states, Reference to the act of thinking about the issue and forming a belief imply that the statement I exist is not a priori but a posteriori, since the relevant aspect of these acts is that they are experienced. Likewise, the fact that this belief is implied as a product of my reflection makes it analytic. The situation is quite natural, for the strange loop between subject and object which is conveyed in our being conscious of being conscious reflects the equivalence between analytic and a posteriori in this particular case. Logic is just experience when it concerns awareness of the self, just as experience is logic. It is only through the separation of subject and object that the two can be seen in opposition. The analytic a posteriori is the point of fusion between the subjective realm of the analytic a priori and the objective domain of the synthetic a posteriori, just as self-consciousness is the bridge between the abstract domain of mind and the concrete external world. It is the infinite recursion generated by self-reference which unites the subject and object as that entity we call self-consciousness, and it is the unity of logic and experience which makes self-consciousness the ground of all other knowledge. We do not merely know of the existence of ourselves through our own self-reflection, but we exist as products of our own self-reflection. That is, the nature of self is its awareness of itself. In the words of Johann Fichte, the self's own positing is thus its own pure activity. The self posits itself, and by virtue of this mere self-assertion it exists. And conversely, the self exists and posits its own existence by virtue of merely existing. It is at once the agent and the product of action, the active and what the activity brings about. Action and deed are one and the same, and hence the I am expresses an act, and the only one possible as will inevitably appear from the science of knowledge as a whole. In conclusion, let us be aware that a constant theme in systematic philosophy is the intention to talk of the world as a whole, and so the theorist is always a component of their own theories. Self-reference is at the core of all philosophy, 
and there is no proper philosophy which is not meta-philosophy. We find these paradoxical notions emerging in all philosophic disciplines because we are ultimately describing our own descriptions. The fundamentality of our own self-consciousness imparts itself on everything we do. It leaves a stamp of its own nature which, when we try to eliminate ourselves, confounds us to the utmost degree. Academic philosophy is merely a magnification and systematization of the same conscious thought that is present in all things, and so if self-referential activity is central to the basic mechanism of such thought, then it shall be central in any formalism thereof. The key to understanding all things, therefore, begins with understanding oneself.